Unit 13, Security and Scale of Production. In Unit 9, we looked at um, issues uh, surrounding security for urban agricultural sites and equipment. And in this unit, we'll take a closer look at some of the possible solutions. Uh, we also looked at uh, scale of production in Unit 9, and we'll take a little bit further look at that in this unit. Uh, I decided to include this slide called Reverse Security. Um, because in Unit 9, we looked at security from the standpoint of securing our site, preventing theft or damage to the sites. But um, there's also a flip side to security, and that's protecting the public from us, rather than protecting us from the public. For instance, if you have flammable liquids, such as gasoline or oil or diesel or something like that, uh, that you keep on site, or toxic chemicals, pesticides, insecticides, um, uh, any number of assorted uh, chemicals actually fall into that category, then environmental regulations and safety regulations, OSHA, um, require that they be kept inside locked cabinets that are clearly labeled as containing flammable or toxic materials. And if we have hazards on our sites, um, then the site should have signage warning people to stay out. Um, and depending on the nature of the hazard, the site may require access restrictions such as fencing. Um, the types of hazards that I'm talking about here include things like uh, open pits for any purpose, um, open water tanks, uh, livestock manure retention areas, dangerous structures, that sort of thing. So that's the flip side to the security that we looked at previously. So let's take a look at the need for security back to the protecting our sites end of things. Um, and while it's easy to imagine all sorts of security issues and all sorts of things happening, um, the reality is most sites can generally get by with minimum security. Uh, tools and equipment should be locked up in a secure building or shed, but for the actual site, um, simple no trespassing signs are often good enough. Um, I visited many uh, community gardens and uh, urban agricultural sites um, that have nothing more than a couple of no trespassing signs and uh, lockable sheds for equipment, and they seem to be doing fine. Um, if the relations uh, with the surrounding community are good, and especially if the community is involved and supports the project, you know, uh, community gardens or community supported agriculture, um, then often there won't be any requirement for security beyond signage. And that's usually done for legal reasons to limit liability of the operators should someone be injured on a site. You know, that kind of that reverse security thing we talked about. But well, let's look at some of the more involved um, solutions to security issues uh, that we brought up, uh, the, the issues that we brought up in Unit 9, um, lighting being one of them. Um, the simplest form of security beyond good neighbor relations um, and a few no trespassing signs is probably lighting. Vandals and thieves want to be unobserved, and if the site has decent lighting, um, they will often go somewhere else. Um, lighting can be expensive, and many sites may not have electricity. However, there are some simple solutions if power is available. For instance, motion-activated or infrared-activated lighting um, is widely available at uh, almost any home store, Lowe's, Home Depot, Menards, that type of thing, and is quite inexpensive. Often, 
less than fifteen dollars per fixture. I've purchased a few myself for myself for uh, thirteen, fourteen bucks. Um, they are motion activated, so they're not on all the time. But if someone or something of sufficient size uh, comes within range of the sensor, uh, the light turns on. Um, that type of lighting is often um, an excellent uh, means of deterrent. There, there's the element of surprise when the light comes on suddenly that's been off. Uh, and they are quite bright and light up an area. The sensors are usually adjustable in sensitivity. So if you have an area where a lot of uh, smaller animals run by, you know, raccoons or dogs or cats or something like that, you can change the sensitivity um, so that the light isn't turning on all the time with those. Um, the advantages include the fact that the lights are off and are therefore not using electricity until they get activated. Um, rather than lighting up a whole area at night, you have these types of lights. They're not costing you anything until something causes them to activate. Um, and as I mentioned, they provide an element of surprise when they turn on and give the, the impression that security may be more high tech. Um, and the lights are really easily mounted to a building or pole and cover a wide area, typically um, you know, up to 120 degrees and maybe even more uh, of arc. And uh, so mounting one, for instance, on, uh, you know, opposite corners of, uh, of a shed can cover, you know, two lights can cover most of the area around a shed. Um, four lights would cover the whole thing pretty much. Uh, so while lighting can be expensive to get big mercury vapor lights installed on high poles that operate all the time, um, something like this. Uh, can be done relatively inexpensively. You know, you can buy uh, six of these things uh, for a hundred bucks and spread them around the site if you have power available. Video surveillance. Video systems can provide an excellent deterrent to thieves and vandals. Um, and on another note, um, you know, if something does happen, they can give you a record of what it was that happened and how it happened so that perhaps you can take steps to uh, prevent that in the future. Um, when we think of video surveillance, I think most of us think of, uh, you know, pretty complicated um, and expensive systems. But for under $200, uh, you can buy a system that has four infrared cameras, which can see in the dark. So you may not need additional lighting along with the cameras to see what's going on. Um, <clears throat> and includes a four channel digital recorder for 180 bucks. Um, simply mounting some of these cameras because dumb, dummy cameras are also available, which give the impression of video security at even lower cost. You can often buy these cameras for 20 bucks that look like a real video camera. Um, mounting a few video cameras around the site um, and including a warning sign that video uh, surveillance is uh, being done there uh, gives an excellent deterrent. Now these do require electricity but there are some which can be operated from batteries that could be recharged by solar power during the day. Um, and there are wireless cameras that are available for under $40 each that don't require running wires to each camera location, which can be an expense to run wires over a large area. Um, wireless cameras can be mounted and broadcast, um, typically an IP uh, network type of system. Alarms. Alarm systems, including intrusion and fire, give audible warnings such as sirens and or silently summon emergency services. Um, such alarm systems for open spaces, such as an urban farm, usually use a beam and detector system. Um, 
So if you can imagine a line and one end of it has a beam source, the other end has a detector, <clears throat> pardon me, if something breaks that beam momentarily, like a person walking through, uh, that activates the alarm, whether it sounds or quietly summons uh, the police, uh, depends on how it's set up. Now, alarm systems can be had for under $300. Again, not a hugely expensive thing in itself. Uh, though, to actually summon police or fire services, something like that, um, there's uh, the added cost of connecting the alarm system to the telephone system to make those calls. And uh, then uh, if you have such a system, then you pretty much have to have a 24-hour remote monitoring uh, set up, and that adds a monthly cost. Also, alarms require electricity to operate, but again, some might be able to run on batteries recharged by solar panels. Um, so we're working our way up in expenses here <laughs> uh, from, you know, very inexpensive signs to somewhat more expensive, but still quite inexpensive lighting, um, uh, video surveillance, alarm systems, um, but all of these are possible on a relatively small budget. Next is fencing. And fencing is probably the most expensive solution that we've talked about here. If your site doesn't already have fencing, it's going to cost more than lighting, video surveillance, or alarms, but it's often used in conjunction with such systems. Um, alarm uh, beam and detector systems are often mounted uh, on the fence posts or just inside the fences. Um, and uh, lighting can be set up to, to light up the fence area. Um, chain link fencing provides good security at a relatively low cost and can be installed by the end user. Um, though some specialized equipment such as the chain link fence stretcher is usually required, um, that equipment uh, can usually be rented um, and it's very inexpensive uh, to rent. Wooden board fencing um, is, of course, much more attractive, but it's also more expensive. Um, but many board on board uh, wooden fences are actually not wooden, they're made of recycled plastic, and in some cases that can be less expensive than wood. It might be that you want to set up a, an attractive fence on the face, the main face of the property, um, and use a, a chain link, uh, less, a, less attractive, but less costly fence, you know, around the sides that aren't as visible. Neighbor and community relations, as we mentioned at the beginning, um, perhaps uh, the best source of security is a good neighbor and community relations. Um, people who are invested and involved in the project are going to be less likely to cause problems the more they feel it's benefiting them and their neighborhood, and they'll be more likely to prevent problems from occurring. And the community gives you multiple pairs of eyes uh, to keep watch, and that is often the best security that you can possibly get. So that ends part one of this unit.